ecology is a perspective that sees all life forms, man, moose, or microbe, as having an equal right to survive and flourish. Its founding philosopher was Arne Ness, a Norwegian, who was anticipated in some respects by Aldo Leopold, an American. One of its leading proponents in recent years was David Orton. But David was not only an ecological philosopher and a bold thinker, he was a deeply principled man who made a remarkable effort to live in accordance with his beliefs. After working as a shipwright, a university professor, and an organizer, he spent his last 20 years minimizing his ecological footprint by subsisting on a small hill farm in Nova Scotia, which he and his wife, Helga Hoffman Orton, deliberately allowed to become overgrown and to return to forest. He ran for Parliament as a Green Party candidate and supported local ecological causes, but his main effort went into his deep green blog, where he strove to create a philosophical position called left biocentrism that blended the essence of his earlier Marxism with the tenets of deep ecology. Those preoccupations may seem a bit arcane, and for many people they are. But the fundamental factor in our environmental crisis is something that might be called bad understanding, bad attitude, bad philosophy, or bad spirituality. David was no mystic, but I suspect that many mystics would find something to admire in his asceticism, his intensity, and his determination to live a life that he himself could regard as moral. In early 2011, David Orton was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. He faced his own death with great courage and dignity, and I was fortunate enough to interview him just a couple of weeks before he died. May he rest in peace. Here's our conversation. I wanted to start um, by asking you about being in a council of all beings, <laughs> as that struck me as being an absolutely fascinating experience. And, and uh, so you're dealing with visions and you're dealing with, with speaking for another life form. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what that's like? Uh, yeah, the Council of All Beings was uh, something developed within um, deep ecology by Arne Nass and, um, and, a few, and several other people. Um, there's a little book out on it, but I mean, we, we've sort of, I guess one of my first introduction was uh, when we went to a, a, a deep ecology workshop in Vermont. And what was very interesting, I was struggling to define a left position within deep ecology. And a, a person called uh, Andy McLaughlin, who has a very important book out uh, on industrial society and deep ecology, he led this council. And, you know, basically we sat quietly on a hilltop and people took, you know, decided what life form or it could actually be a river or a mountain or water that they wanted to to take on and they we made masks at that time you don't have to but you made masks representing that and you speak through that mask basically from the how you see the impact of humankind upon what you are whether you're i i, I was always a coyote by the way so the, and uh, you know, being a coyote or like being a river or whatever it was. And so people spoke of the pain of this. And it was basically, it was a, a way of trying to cut across this border of anthropocentrism where you, everything is seen as a resource and there for humankind. It's like moving to a level where, you know, you're part of an ecocentric universe where you're just one species among other species and that you have no rights to dominate other species. So it was like a teaching form. And um, it's, it, we've, um, when, when I went there, it was with Judy Davis, uh, who's died now, but, uh, but we've had Council of All Beings at the um, Billy McDonald's workshop and things like that, you know, uh, up where he, where he is. So I don't know if that answers what you're No, I, 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 I uh I wanted to know, I guess, what the, what the actual structure was, how a council like that yeah. works. And I guess the further question is, what does it make you feel? How do you feel when you're, when you're being a coyote? Well, you feel very emotional, especially when you hear the... Um, like, sometimes it's, it's quite symbolic there. You know, you could have drums or a flute interspersing each people speaking. But it's like quite an emotional kind of experience. And, I mean, I've 
had friends who, oh, that's Lala, Eco Lala, and all the rest of it. But once they experience it, it is a way of sort of trying to bridge this divide. I mean, um, so it's like a teaching tool, that's all. In a way, almost like immersing yourself in the very tenets of deep ecology. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So how at a practical you? level, you know. Yeah, but also on an emotional level. Yeah, so oh, no, you, you no, well, I mean emotional too, yeah. you know, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Earth bonding, that's what I always said that Billy McDonald did, it's sort of earth bonding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So then we talk, let's talk a little bit about deep ecology and what deep ecology is and, and, and where the boundaries of it might lie. Yeah, well, I think uh, the route to deep ecology is highly individual and um, I know for myself, like um, when I was in BC, I think that was a transforming period for myself in terms of my consciousness. And I started to see things like being very ridiculous, like with Macmillan Bodell. They had a, a slogan which said, um, uh, forest productivity, or like forests are for primarily for lumber production. And then, you know, when they talked about clear cuts and the impact on sort of say raptors or or woodpeckers, well, they would put up nest boxes <laughs> in the clear cuts. So, and then you came to see that, like, there was, it was always humans first, you know, like, and uh, I mean, I was moving away from that and sort of, I know when we came to, um, when we came to Nova Scotia and uh, in 79 and just in the early 80s had that Royal Commission on Forestry, and I made a presentation there, not for the people on the panel, you know, had total disregard for them, but like basically just to get the point of view out. And, uh, in, you know, I hadn't come across deep ecology yet, but it was like what I did was to present what, what I considered to be an ecocentric sort of view of the world, you know, and if you look at it, you see it's kind of deep ecology, even though there's no mention of deep ecology. I didn't come across deep ecology until the mid 80s, you know, so, um, but it, it's, so I think that people are on a path and then uh, they, they come to see deep ecology, like for example, somebody like Sharon Lubchuk in Prince Edward Island, who's probably the leading radical environmentalist there. She, I don't know, she, she heard me speak and it was reported in a book by some, um, one of these uh, uh, journalists from, I think it was from Ryerson, he came and interviewed me. And she said, and Nasser said that himself, like when he spoke, people said to him, oh, you know, that's what I believe. And then, and Sharon said, well, that's the first time I had the language for that. Like, so I think it's, Nasser's contribution was to you know, and he would say that himself. It's not to discover deep ecology. He always laid that at the feet of Carson. And, um, you know, and I wrote about that. I'm not sure about that. I would say it's more at the feet of Leopold, Aldo Leopold. Mm -hmm. But um, it's sort of something which, uh, you know, that you, wh when you find the philosophy, you realize like that there's actually a language. And so when I discovered deep ecology for myself, you know, what you see is, like, and this is, uh, for me, is very important, that you have to say, like, there is a way forward in this society, you know, like, a, in other words, you know, the, anyway, without getting into what deep ecology is all about, so that, and then you try to apply deep ecology, like, to particular issues, whether it's, you know, here, whether it's the off-highway vehicle issue, or whether it's the forestry or pesticides or whatever it is, but you always try to, um, you know, become a, a um, what do you can say, like a, a spokesperson for deep ecology, you know, sort of. And, and I think for myself, like when I look back, I think I, after coming in contact with deep ecology, basically, I think I introduced deep ecology to the Maritimes, and you know, so that and for for it to have a voice, and so you have. A few people now, at least, especially up in this area, who seek to find themselves as deep ecologists, you know, mm -hmm. like Mark Brennan or Sharon Lubchuk or Billy McDonald, you know, and there are others as well. So, anyway, so I'd, 
Well, you said without getting into what deep ecology is, but 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 do yeah. get into that if you wouldn't mind. Cause <laughs> no, you know, sure. Yeah, it's, it's not well, a familiar. I mean, it's familiar to some of us. No, but, I know. But uh, no, what? well, uh, Nas. Um, I think the essence of deep ecology is coming into a new relationship with the natural world, and basically that's to say that um, other life forms have their own intrinsic value, and the, that value is not dependent upon them being given that value by humans, so that's, that will be one point. Another point would be, and I think this is very important, and of course this is where the, the mainstream and the radical environmental movement diverge. Na Nass made, made a distinction between shallow and deep ecology. Now, these aren't self-serving terms which they seem, they're basically argumentation patterns. So shallow, uh, shallow ecology was that ecology which took for granted industrial society and tried to clean its act up. And uh, deep ecology was seeing that um, the, the fundamental environmental problems were a product of industrial society. And so basically you had to replace industrial society if you wanted to address, address environmental issues. You know, I, I think, um, so, in, so in that sense, um, industrial society, it's not, it's also anti-capitalist too. Um, you know, that the basically, capital, you know, and I'm talking about NAS and also for myself, that capitalism, you know, is built on growth and no ecological limits and profit, we all know that. And um, so if you have a society, an economic system which doesn't recognize economic e uh, ecological limits, then you're going to basically um, get into serious trouble. So what, what Nass said that it wasn't capitalism per se or socialism, it was industrial society, and industrial society could have a capitalist or a socialist face. Now, if you read Nass, he's much more sympathetic to socialism, like he would say, for example, that uh, many of the best fighters in, on the environmental side come from the socialist movement. But he also had the, you know, the criticism of socialism and Marxism, which I have as well. So if I could maybe illustrate it with um, a practical application, which you know, wasn't too long ago, and that was the off-highway vehicle issue. And I don't know if you saw that. So what you have is, um, I forget the name of the group now that runs all those things. Um, Anyway, it's funded by the government, you know, the, um, and th they basically make the pretense that they're um, an objective viewpoint and open to everyone. But they, they, they represent like the class position in, in, in Nova Scotia. Um, I'm just trying to think of the name, it's just gone from my head. Voluntary yeah, voluntary planning. Oh, voluntary planning. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, yes. you know, there's a book out on and you can read it. And so it's been going for a long time. And if you look at it, you see, like, for example, in terms of forestry or, or pesticides, they've always taken the wrong side, the rotten side, the in industrial forestry side, and tried to present it as being what the citizens want. So, so the first thing, sort of, when you have, like, the question of um, a so-called investigation into off-highway vehicles, that these people are running it. And then when you go there and listen to them, most of them are uh, riding off high vehicles, whether it's snow snowmobiles or ATVs or whatever it is. So they, they talk about like they're being open and they have no pre preconceived view, views. But basically they start with a position that off-highway vehicles are a legitimate uh, activity and a legitimate entry into the wilderness or the woods. And, you know, so from that follows the question of whether it shouldn't be allowed to happen is not even up for discussion. So what happens is that the fight becomes there over the question of private property and the question that um, people, you know, and you know, rightly so, I mean, there have been a lot of stories in the paper that um, they resent that off-highway vehicles can run across so-called private land mm -hmm. and they can do nothing about it. So the question comes up about regulating and bearing in mind private property, but from a deep ecology view, this presupposes private property. 
-hmm. in other words. So the idea that you can own land and own other species and all the rest of it. So, you know, like somebody like myself, I mean, uh, you go there and you made a presentation, actually, I think it was published, it was published in the Herald. And then ultimately, and this is like I've tried to take part in the wider national and international discussion, like, and I work closely, well, closely, with Doug Tompkins the Foundation for Deep Ecology, and they brought a book out and they asked me to participate, called Off Highway Vehicle. And um, so it's a, a copy now, I can give you a copy if you want it, I have one or two extra ones. And so what I did there was to, and they asked me, the editor, to provide the theoretical foundations for the discussion. Like it's full of articles by academics and no one talks about deep ecology. But like I talk about it from the viewpoint of deep ecology, like drawing on the Nova Scotia experience, but also like raising some of those theoretical issues. You know. So that will be an example of that fairly recently. You know. and, yeah, and you've touched on the issue of, of private property mm. and, and, uh, and the ownership of land and so forth. And one of the features of deep ecology would be a denial that that's a legitimate way to to be in the world, right? Yeah, that's right. At the same time, you have people, this is a struggle within deep ecology, you have many academics who come forward as deep ecology supporters, and they write in various magazines like The Trumpeter or, you know, there are other magazines too. So they have sort of come to terms within capitalist society, you know, they have a good living and all the rest of it, and they're quite di disassociated from the movement from the issues which, you know, radicals want answers for and things like that. So you imagine in the States, if you're teaching in a university with that horrible climate down there and you start talking like that about private property, all hell is going to descend on you. So they end up shutting up about it. And like a good example will be, and he's a friend of mine and he's helped me a lot in terms of books like Doug Tonkins. They, um, they celebrate like what they call private lands philanthropy, which is um, well-off people often putting aside money to buy land, but they never raise this, which is okay to do that. Of course, it's only temporary because unless you change the system, it's all ultimately going to be wiped out. But they never, but he doesn't, they don't raise the question. This is a foundation of deep ecology about the basic essence of, of deep ecology, which it's not just NAS, it's people like John Livingston, who was like um, uh, Suzuki's mentor, or Rudolf Barrow from, you know, anyway, um, Stan Rowe, people like that. They all had this position. So I feel, even though it's very unpopular, like it's very, one has to raise these issues and, and, and try and get them into the into the culture for discussion, you know, of course, and as you say, that's a, a big question, you know. Well, it's a fundamental question, isn't mm. it? And yeah. I, um, for me, the great sort of uh, comment on that one was Big Bear, the Cree leader, you know, when he was told that he would receive, his people would receive land if they signed the treaty, and he said, how can a man receive land? From yeah. whom would he receive it? Yeah. And th that incomprehension is, is yeah. you know, You'd like to get that back into the conversation somehow. Yeah. It's like saying you can receive it, you can you can own air or something like that. Yeah. So this came up here with the Friends of Red Tail Society, where, um, you know, on, on one hand, you know, it's quite wonderful what they've done. They raise that money, but at the same time, from my point of view, they also have to raise this basic deep ecology position so that they're not consolidating these ideas about land ownership and all the rest of it. So. They asked me to endorse their thing, so I, you know, if you look at my endorsement, <laughs> it tries to straddle those two positions, you know, sort of supporting them, but at the same time raising the question about NAS and all the rest of it. And I know when I, I went, to, um, you know, they had the so-called token participation from natural resources on this whole issue of uh, citizens buying land. I went to Truro and I sort of basically gave this position. It was it was a totally disgusting meeting. They had a PR person there who just read their their paper, you know, and it was just uh, really really bad. But anyway, mm -hmm. but you've I, I sense in your own writing some disquiet about the fact that you own land. 
Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, well the thing I'm see, not saying you shouldn't. I'm no, just, no. But I'm saying no, I sense no, but I mean, matter. it's like you're in the system, and I mean, yeah. like, I think I use that example, like, and uh, when I gave that talk in 2006 to the, the Federal Greens, and they suddenly they all laughed when I said, we bought this land, but I don't believe in land ownership. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the thing there, you know, and um, it's just like you're in the system, but you... So you had to participate, you know, at the same time you tried to raise the other values, so... Yeah, so it, but it's a difficult position, isn't it? You're, you're, mm. you're, you know, you are in the system, you're quite right, you can't mm. step outside it, it's, it's, it mm. surrounds you. And at the same time you have to sort of challenge it in a fundamental way. That's right, know? yeah. Now, your background is in left-wing politics, mm -hmm. but you've said that your personal journey was shaped by two pivotal experiences, and one of them was South Moresby, and the other one was uranium mining here. Mm. Tell me about the South Moresby one to start with. Uh, yeah, the South Moresby one was, um, well, but, you know, I, I went and I got a job on, the, on a fish, uh, on a trolling camp, you know, a fish camp for Canada packers, and uh, the narrators broke up there at the same time. I, and Helga was in Victoria, and she uh, br brought a two-person kayak up to the Charlottes. And we just took off for a month, you know. I mean, it was in some ways quite stupid. I mean, not it was a great adventure, but when you look at today, like the precautions people make, and it's very wild and rough, and and so you know, we went down there to Windy Bay and all those places, and basically we ate edible plants and fished over the side of the kayak, and uh, I lived off the land, you know. So that was a. Um, it was like what you ca what you I guess what I came to see was, you know, we had close calls. I mean, remember once being on top of with a small pup tent and it almost being blown away and putting rocks on the side. Like basically, you had to respect the natural forces and adapt to them. You couldn't substitute yourself for them. So, I think that was a lesson for me, you know, and for how it was also a very good bonding session for the two of us, even though we had quite a few struggles on it, you know, so, anyway. But, so it's almost like an immersion experience. It's, it, yeah, it, yeah. Was, yeah, it was, you know, like we, we were on our own, it was very tough and, um, and we were quite exhausted when we got back, you know, sort of thing, but it was quite wonderful too, you know, and I came to have an appreciation of the Charlottes and the natural life there, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's and that's that sinks into you and changes yeah. your outlook. I was expecting you to say it was something about logging. I didn't expect it to be a, a romantic idyll. <laughs> <with it. laughs> yeah, well, the logging is everywhere, you know, sort yeah. of thing, you know. And uh, you know, the locals, you know, they they rely on, rely on the logging, like for jobs and all. And they'd always say, "Oh, well, it all grows back." You know, there's enormous rainfall there, you know, and it'll all grow back, but. Um, you know, of course, logging's uh, the the old growth trees are part of it. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the uranium mining because that was obviously not a romantic experience. No, uranium mining. So we came here when we came to Nova Scotia. There were two issues I got involved with. I think maybe the first one was the uranium issue, and we were living in in Halifax and uh, also forestry. And we we bought an old truck which was really falling apart, but um, started going around the, the province organizing, talking to people because, you know, rarely you had that granitic rock, that's one source of it, you had uranium uh, traces and then also you had it with the sedimentary rock out, out, up here on the North Shore, Shore where it was sort of being washed down. So what was happening then was that the, it was like the geologists who were um, becoming the spokespersons for the uranium mines. Like, in, I always remember in my head this picture of a, a mine in uh, France, of course, which they rely heavily on nuclear power with contented cows around the, you know, and this was it. And of course, no one talked about the Serpent River and what had happened like in Northern Ontario, like with the indigenous people, Aboriginal people. So, I mean, what I saw was that in order to take them on, you have to have a certain level of um, scientific knowledge. I mean, 
NASA always said that, you know, they have all the facts and what we have to do is bring out the values. But, you know, there's a certain level there. So, I mean, what I did was I, I, I think I took grade, you know, I took grade 12 chemistry and grade 11 biology. And then I went to Dow to um, study uranium geochemistry because I thought if I could do that, then I could bring out that knowledge in a simplified form. Like, and when I was there, anyway, this is a little story, I was so busy that I wasn't going to complete the paper. And the person running the course, I don't remember, but it was a progressive social democrat and his wife, you probably know them, was my, my tutor or whatever. And she said, David, <laughs> you've got to do your paper because all these people are looking at you, you know, and she meant like the industry people, you know. So at the same time, Halger was um, a nurse and with a lot of background in, um, in you know, health, health issues. And so, and she was much more of a scientific person than, than me. And we basically put together um, a leaflet on uh, with something called something like a uranium chemistry and the, and the water question or something like that because what you had here is you as you always have in every issue total denial on the part of the authorities you know like you had Jack Garnett who was in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, natural resources oh we have the best uh, guidelines in Canada you know and of course once you look into things in Saskatchewan and you get the reports like you know you get all the reports in Saskatchewan and uh, and also from BC, you see it's a total fiction. So, you know, then out of that came, when they were finally forced to set something up, they used, what's the name of the guy who was basically a fascist? Um, he was a judge there. Oh, McCleave, McCleave. Did you ever meet McCleave? I did, yeah. Okay, so he, you know, the, he, get, the, he had three jobs. One of them, he was a one-man commissioner and he had three jobs. One was running the Workman's Compensation Board and another he was a, he was a judge and that, so it was total farce. So um, I don't know if you followed that, it was really very sharp here. So what we decided to do was to work with the progressive people and, um, you know, because like the mainstream always follows along with that, you know, because they don't think there's any other, any other alternative. So we, we set up a, a coalition of progressive people and then drafted our own guidelines for an inquiry and it just like flipped him out, you know, sort of thing. So he started, you know, citing people for contempt and all kinds of things. So it was really, he sort of discredited himself because he didn't narrow his attack, you know, if he just focused on one or two people, but he sort of opened up, you know, like people like Dean Whalen or there was a friend of ours, or, up in Amherst, you know, and they, so like, it started to come clear there's something wrong with this guy, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, when, when they held the inquiry, um, overwhelmingly the people um, were against it, and I remember, that's when I come to um, Nova Scotia, and actually I, I joined, don't ever say, <laughs> I joined EAC, the Uranium Committee, trying to work with them, you know, and it was just like impossible. They were so conservative and they didn't want to have the direction to, 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 uh, in the committee. So I ended up sort of summarizing things and there was, there was quite a long article in the Herald on it, you know, sort of thing, but anyway, mm. probably wandered all over the place. No, not at all. I, I, uh, but the, um, the interesting thing was that the, we did get a, a moratorium on uranium yeah. exploration and mining out of all of that. That's yeah. right, because yeah. it was in, and I, I guess what I should have said, which was important for me, was that the question of like having to look at fossils, you know, in the geology department, apart from knowledge, like that was really crucial because I really saw, Jesus, what's all the fuss about humans, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, know we're, you know, we're just here for a very small time, you know, sort of thing like yeah. that. So yeah. I, I learned uh, a lot from it, but I, I did do that work in order to take part in the discussion because mm -hmm. like someone had to do it and like I say I went all over the place along here you know and met many many people you know. Mm. So if, if, I, if I were to summarize I would say the South Moresby experience really was is 
it's like your face-to-face -face encounter with, with nature as, a, as an everyday reality, as something you have to cope with, as something you come to understand and engage with in a very deep and personal and immediate way. And then you come here and the experience of geology tells you that, um, that all of this human activity is, occurs as a flicker in time. Is that, is yeah, that fair? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. So then you, see, then you wind up seeing human beings as being um, just kind of like the lip of the, of the long wave of time, but, but not intrinsically of, of, of uh, crucial importance to the earth. Right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. at the same time, one has to keep a sense of social justice and fight for social justice. Like, yeah. one of the things with NAS, like he made a distinction between the environmental movement, uh, the peace movement, and the social justice movement. And he said, well, environmentalists concentrate on the environmental movement, and that was picked up by people like NAS and Sessions. And I always felt that was wrong, because deep ecology was a often accused by the left, who were very human-centered of being quite right-wing and um, anti-human, you know, whereas, I mean, what I felt, which, which sort of reflected my own experience, you know, you take part in all those struggles. I mean, you I mean, I concentrated after BC on environmental issues, but it didn't mean to say I wasn't interested in, you know, anti-racism or whatever it was, mm -hmm. Aboriginal issues, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a sense in which if you don't get the environmental stuff right, the rest of it doesn't matter. No, well, right? that's it. It becomes like the priority, you know, because, um, you know, like, what was it, Stan Rowe would say, we're first earthlings and we're second human beings, you know, which is basically what I, I believe, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And th all of this leads you to, to be sharply critical of, of some of the language that's used in these things. I mean, I'm thinking of, for example, your... Um, your attitude towards a word like re resource or <laughs> harvest or wind farm. Or yeah. Tell me about that, because this has all led you to kind of feel a need to reform language a bit. Yeah. Well, I think language reflects philosophy, you know, basically. And so when you, you know, and if you have a human-centered philosophy, which has been around for a long time, then it will be reflected in the language. And resource is a good example, I guess. Resourcism, the person who really went to town on that was John Livingstone in his books like Rogue Primate or The Palace of Wildlife Conservation. Wind farm, it's a way of um, smothering over actually industrial turbines, you know, it's industrializing the herb, the rural landscape. And harvest, it's, you know, it, it, it sort of treats the forest as it's like an agricultural crop, you know, sort of thing, or the question of weed species, you know, weed species from the view of the point in uh, the pulp and paper industry, you know, there's no weed species in nature, you know. It's like, um, I was like that, I think I mentioned it there once uh, recently, that, you know, that idea that a weed is a plant out of place, that's all, you know. Yeah. Talk a little more about resource, because I think what Livingston said, or as you've reflected in some of your writing, that, the, that if you call it a resource, you change its character. You, right? Yeah, that's right. If you call something a resource, you presume that it's there for human use. You know, so um, at the same time, if you don't use that word, it often becomes difficult to find the language, you know, so the alternative language, you know. but. That, that's the basic idea of resourcism, that you, it's, if you s talk about things as a resource, whether it's this or that or the rest of it, or fish as a resource or whatever, trees as a resource, you presuppose that it's there for human use with that, that sort of arrogance, you know, that human arrogance, anthropocentrism again, you know. Mm. And it's funny that uh, Livingstone wasn't a, a left-wing person, he was a kind of a mystic and uh, but a kind of a wonderful naturalist, you know, and uh, I, so at the same time he came to define himself as a deep ecologist, you know, sort of thing, and uh, like he, he was t far, too, uh, far too far out for people like Monty Hummel or um, Suzuki or anything like that. They all acknowledged they were influenced by him, but he all went too far, you know. <laughs> but you would have said in some ways not far enough. Well, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I think li with Livingston, um, 
you know, he he wasn't really political, so, you know, he was he didn't really have any idea of how the new form of society would would come about, you know. But mm -hmm. it's quite funny because, like, when I wrote that paper with, um, I think Billy and uh, Ian White contributed and published it, his son, Lee Livingston, who's an academic, <laughs> got in touch with us, and he came on that bio and he said, oh. He said, you really summarise my dad's ideas, <laughs> it's, you know, better than I could do it, you know. So I thought, well, maybe I didn't get it wrong. <laughs> you know, you try to, I think you have a very big responsibility if you're writing to define someone, whether it's Dan Rowe or Livingston or Nasser or anything like that. Like you have to do the work to look into someone and it t takes ages and ages and ages, you know, like I, in the era, you know, when I read books and they're important books, I always write a summary of them, you know, and keep that so I can, uh, the, what seem to be like the key ideas, because as well as giving one's own view, you know, you have to faithfully represent the uh, position of the uh, person you're, you're interviewing. Mm. And, you know, sometimes people disagree with you, like uh, I know I just wrote this thing on John Muir, and it came out of... Um, uh, somebody saying to me, well, you know, why you talk about Nass and uh, Carson and Leopold, but what's wrong with John Muir? He was much more influential, you know, so, I mean, I'd never read John Muir before, and I, I don't think he's, he's that key up here in Canada, but I mean, I know he's influential, so, you know, I got a big reader, over 500 pages, and then I wrote a bi got read, you know, there was a biography recommended, and I wrote something about it, but I got hammered by a couple of people who said I got it all wrong. You know, other people didn't say that, but, uh, you know, you have to, you have to, well, you know that as a writer, like, you basically have to convey the integrity of the person you're writing about, you know, and it requires a lot of work, you know. Mm -hmm. But I've always mm -hmm. been interested in theoretical questions. You know. Well, yeah, tell me about that too, because I think a lot of people would say that you do, like you, you, you know, that's overwhelmingly where you put your attention has been on theoretical questions. And I suspect a lot of people would say, why there? Why, why is that important enough for you to have given it so much attention? Yeah, I think it <laughs> sort of started a long time ago, like, um, going to Sir George and then to graduate school and, um, you know, being involved in the movement. Uh, um, I don't know, it just seemed to me that, that so often there really wasn't a discussion of things, you know, and um, I'm not, you know, I, I feel that philosophy and or theory and action has to go together, like, you know, you basically, you know, it's just sort of simplistic to say that, but, you know, both have to go together, you know, and so often, you know, I mean, I know, I know quite a few people like activists, like, they don't look at overall what they're doing, I mean, it's no good working hard and reinforcing the system as far as I'm concerned, so you've got to work hard, but you've got to undermine the system too, you know, so you should you don't reinforce it with your activities, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and I I think in a way like the the authorities like the uh, the RCMP they see that in me. I mean I I'll show you later on if you like there. But there's a book there. There've been a few things, but there's a book there called an Un unauthorized history of the RCMP, mm -hmm. and it's by a couple of what I call house Marxists, and it it deals when I was organising on the on the campus at uh, Regina and uh, there was a seminar called uh, Revolt versus the Status Quo and people who were there, there's a guy called Schumacher, you might have heard of him, a very right-wing um, Regina lawyer and chief cooks in the RCMP. Anyway, the RCMP were there too, so they, I didn't know this, I found out by reading the book, so they approached the university and they wanted to prepare a case against me for sedition, you know, sort of thing. So, um, so they wanted the tapes and they wanted the cooperation of the person who was chairing the thing when the case came to court. So, of course, they got all nervous then about academic freedom and all the rest of it. So they declined to do that. But, and I know 
just recently there was some release of um, I think papers on the CIA or whatever it was and I forget what they were what it was called now but somebody called me from Toronto and uh, they you know I guess my name was involved and I, I hadn't seen these papers or anything like that but they end up ended up interviewing um, an, ac an academic from um, Simon Fraser, I think, you know, sort mm -hmm. of thing. So, anyway, I think I've always been of concern to them, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would hope so. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a waste if you weren't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, the the whole the whole issue of theory, it seems to me, and, and of, of, of of simultaneously having to live in a certain circumstance and at the same time trying to under, undermine it. You've commented at one point that that. Uh, the part of the job is raising alternative visions, right? Mm. And, uh, That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I tried to do that, say, with the off-highway off vehicle issue, you know, sort yeah. of thing, like another way of like, looking at the world, or, or even like with seals, which has been like a, a very big issue. Like when I came here, uh, what came up more or less straight away in '82 was the grey seals were washing ashore on the beach of the Pictou County without their heads, and so the discussion in the county council was disposal of carcasses, you know, sort of thing. So um, no one was concerned about why they're being shot or anything like that. So I looked into the issue, and Billy looked into it, and we even got Farley Mowat involved. I think he gave us $500 at one time to go around and do a survey on the beaches. And anyway, it's what I saw was important to be a, a voice for the seals here, even though by doing that, you came into contradiction with the fishing industry and fishers, you know, because, you know, I, I know people here, like Mary Gorman would be a good example. They're really progressive animal rights person, lovely person, but they hate seals, or there are too many <laughs> seals, or they should be shot, you know, and, uh, mm. but, and then if you're organizing and you want to um, sort of work with <coughs> fishermen or fishers on, say, marine protective areas or something like that, then you're going to piss them off, you know, like on the seal issues. And, you know, that's happened. I remember when I ran in the last federal election, the guy, I think he's the um, MLA now, I don't know, remember his name now, but he, he's a fisherman. And he said, I like everything you do except your position on seals, you know. <laughs> but what I always did was I always emphasized that, like when we ran in the election, you know, I emphasized the question of uh, it's wrong to kill seals and, you know, and all the rest of it. So I think even if things are highly unpopular, like you have to, you know, if you believe in what you believe in, you have to say something, you know, about that. Mm -hmm. and yes, and that's, that's kind of, uh, you're, you're sort of tilling the ground for something that may happen at some later point, but you at least are, are kind of cracking that monolithic vision of Yeah, well, I, 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 don't, I don't think you'll ever find EAC coming out in defense against the killing of uh, the commercial killing of harp or hooded seals. I've mm -hmm. never heard of that anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and you have some doubts about the Green Party, although you have run for it. Many, them, many yeah. doubts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, because essentially this is shallow ecology? Yeah, that's right. It's basically, um, you know, I was inside, not for about a year, and in the shadow uh, cabinet and all the rest of it, but um, you know there were some good people there. But I mean, what I found was that you can't compromise in terms of working out a position unless you share basic values. You know, like mm -hmm. if if your basic value is to get elected and get into the bourgeois parliament and hold forth there, and you think that positions on population or economic re redistribution or whatever it is are going to terrify the electorate and prevent them from voting, you know, how can you m make an, a, an alliance with somebody like myself? And there were other, a few other people like myself, Sharon Labchuk being one of them. So I came to see that, that you can't, you can't really work together. Like, I mean, I can work with people like Billy McDonald or Ian White or Sharon because like, one of the things I learned coming out of the marxist leninist movement is there it's all, you know, it's organizationally driven. It's sort of from on top and something is decided and then, then people implement it. And I saw in the environmental movement, like, you have to sort of have some basic values.
but then uh, a single spark makes a prairie fire, you know, mm. sort of thing like that. Each person has to be autonomous and you can't boss people around or tell them what to do. And so you, ex you exchange on the, on the basis of um, people who are co-workers, you know. Mm. And um, so when I was in the party, I don't want to speak negatively in that way, but you know, you had a brilliant person who was the leader, a microbiologist, and uh, very charismatic and with a, a critique of the culture, which really interested me. But essentially, um, he, people who were lackeys gravitated around him. He didn't want to hear criticism, you know, mm -hmm. he just wanted to hold forth. And I, that's one of the things which really bothers me about, you know, communism and socialism, like how it's been like that. And I mean, even today, like with the, with the eco-socialists, you know, they, they're very intolerant of different ideas, you know, wh whether some aboriginals or Pentiti, Linkola or whatever it is, I know a lot of the stuff I write, and they're so willing to just dump on you, you know, sort of thing, whereas it seems to me that a socialist society or a communist society ideally should be a different form of society, it should be democratic and people should be able to give their ideas. I know, you know, and Helga's often said that to me, if I was in the former Soviet Union or whatever, I'd have a really hard time, you know, sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean my basic sentiment <laughs> is not there. Like I'm on, I'm on that side of the left-right spectrum, not the capitalist side, mm -hmm. but the main spectrum is the relationship to the natural world, and the other one is secondary to that, you know. Yes, yes, and a, and a communist would not see that. Communists would generally see it the other way around. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you mentioned you mentioned population a moment ago, yeah. and it's a, and it seems to me this is the elephant in the room that so many people are unwilling to speak of. Although you, you're pretty clear about that. What 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 is? Tell me about your view on population. Yeah, well, in, in many ways, I don't think it's really a developed view. I mean, what I, what I seem to do is uh, kind of repeat the position in the platform of the um, of, uh, of a deep ecology platform, that's saying there has to be substantial population reduction, both for non-human kind and also for human kind, and uh, and like sometimes just to tweak people, I say. Nas, Nas said just to, you know, to, he liked to do that because he was sort of playful, you know. Uh, maybe it shouldn't be no more than about a billion people, you know. Now, how to do that? I mean, I think it has to, you know, obviously there are potentials there for fascism and all the rest of it, and uh, and that's what the left always jumps all over, the deep ecology side on that. But I haven't really sort of written a lot on that, although I just brought that out. I mean, I know Michael and um, what's her name, his partner? Linda. Pardon? Linda. Linda. You know, he said, you know, that one of the things they always liked that I always raised the population issue, but I, I haven't really wanted to get in, into it too much because what happens is you're always clobbered as being a mouth using, doesn't matter what you say, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it just mouth using, you know, dismissal. And yeah. uh, so, I mean, I bring it up, but. Um, and I think it's important to do that because people don't do that. But I wouldn't say I've written extensively on it, you know. Oh, no, no, I, you haven't. But no. uh, but you also haven't flinched from pointing no. out that there's no, an implication here. No, well, it would be wrong not to do that, you yeah. know, like, yeah. um, because I don't know how it's going to happen. But, um, you know, when you think about the pre-industrial society and then today, so and then what the future is, uh, you know, it's like mm. choking in our own excrement, you know, sort of thing, so. Mm. Well, you also said just now a reduction in the non-human population, uh, as well as the human population? Yeah, sure, because every time humans expand, other, other life forms retreat. Mm -hmm. You know, you just mm. look, well, you know, you drive into Halifax there, I haven't, first time I've been there for long, long time because of the medical thing, and you see all those houses and apartments that are creeping out, you know, it's like being, getting smothered, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of obvious that's what it is, you know. But that's the reaction of the human population, but you also said non-human, and that's what I was... That's, no, but like in the sense that non-humans have to give way. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. so a reduction of the human population in order to make space for Yeah, I other mean, species. but it will also, like, and us, it wasn't anti human, us wasn't anti human, but he, you know, it was both sides, you know, it's a better life for humans and also, you know, uh, a life, if you like, for mm -hmm. non human life forms, you know. Has anybody really tackled this issue? Uh, well, quite a few people write on it on the internet, but um, I don't know, like them. Um, well, I remember Paul Ehrlich writing the population yeah. bomb, you know, yeah. years and years and years ago, yeah. and, and, and sort of flagging the, the concern about it, and, and I think, you know, everybody recognizes that we've had this incredible growth in, in human population. At the same time, we've had a great, great growth in human expectations. So yeah. the demands are yeah. not only multiplied, you know, in a, in they're, they're exponential in, in terms of the demands on the rest of the world, and that obviously can't continue. But I think we, we have, what we haven't heard is um, is much thought about what you're actually going to do about that. Except, as, which leads me to think that what we're going to do about it is nothing, mm. and and that means it will be done for us. Mm. That's right. Isn't that right? Yeah. And, uh, is there That's any other right. way out of that? Well, I wish there was, but, you know, Nash used to speak about vital needs, what were the vital needs, and uh, it's an interesting concept, but vital just becomes defined by um, PR, right? So, you know, all these gadgets, like uh, you probably listened to the uh, that program at 8.30. Uh, what's her name, Anna? Uh, Anna mm -hmm. Tremonti? Yeah, Anna Maria Tremonti. Uh, Anna Maria, yeah. anyway, so... Um, Oh, I forgot now what I was going to say, but uh, anyway. About pardon? Well, get yeah, what's vital? Yeah. Okay, vital. Okay, mm. so then you they have that guy every Monday. Uh, I forget his name. Talking about the latest developments in uh, uh, communications technology and yeah. what the wonders of the most current thing are and all the rest of it, and it becomes you know. And Billy says that to me. It's so changed with the young people. You know, like you can't really get their attention. Like, you know, you they have all this gear with them. You know, and uh, so the question of vital needs, like you have to totally, you know, I mean, um, an ecological society means much more social control. You know, I mean, I don't think you can impose something from. You know, I don't believe in fascism or authoritarianism mm -hmm. like that because I do believe you have to change consciousness. You know, but. It means much more social control, you know, and, um, and you know, eliminating the advertising <laughs> industry is going to be one of them. You know, mm -hmm. I, I always felt that the idiocy was sort of shown up, like in Suzuki's programs, where he, you know, be a program on the nature of things, and then they, they have the breaks to sh to sell some more stuff, you know, sort of thing, <laughs> and you know he doesn't agree with it, but. You can only get on if he goes along with that, you know, sort of thing, and that's the thing, you know, yeah. so, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I've often said, you know, I've often said that, that regulation is the bastard companion of environmentalism, right? mm. and uh, and and sometimes it gets to be quite stupid. I mean, we wind up, you know, working for um, you know, for certain kinds of changes, and then when you get them, they aren't implemented in a way that makes a whole lot of sense or that yeah. really reflects the issue you saw yeah. in the first place. Well, you see that, like with the, say the wind turbines or biofuels, you know, sort of, you know, just imagine having wheat for biofuels. You know, it's like how stupid can you get? You know, but people there, they they don't understand, and they're just trying to cater to what they see as a possible environmental challenge to them at all. You know? Well, yes, and I guess from a deep ecology point of view, you're not asking the question about do you need that much electricity and no, what do you need it right. for? That that's would be right. the, that's yeah, right. yeah. No, I mean that like to bring in things, you know, like that, whether it's community-owned turbines or whatever, wind turbines, mm -hmm. you know, you have to change your lifestyle and, and reduce that um, people want it all, right? And, uh, and then they end up destroying more and more of the natural world, you know. Mm -hmm. Another and one one other question I, I guess that I that came up in something of yours that I read was a, a comment that there's a skepticism about spiritual questions in the green movement, mm. and you obviously disagreed with that. Yeah, that's right. So you could also say in the left movement. <laughs> yes, you could. <laughs> and yet it's funny if you're a leftist, you know. I mean, uh, I remember we we could stand on the table and sing the red flag and. You know, and all those other Revo you know, Spanish revolutionary songs, and so in that sense, it's a spiritual thing, you know. And you really admire people who sacrifice themselves to go mm -hmm. and 
fight and die in Spain. No, that's right. I mean, one of the things is with me, with me that um, I try to write on that, you know, sort of thing, and um, and part of that left biocentric primer is the question of coming into a, a, like a spiritual relationship, like with the natural world, you know. And that it's spiritual, not in the sense of uh, it's. I, I think it's the closest would be to it would be animism mm -hmm. or pantheism. It's nothing otherworldly. There's no god above or anything like that. So it's it's innerworldly, and um, so and I you know it, it's anyway. That's that's the way I see it. So. Well, that's kind of the starting point for deep, deep ecology, isn't it? I, mean, I think what on the uh, I think I actually have the platform here. Um, yeah, and the, the first item in the, in the Deep Ecology platform is the well-being and flourishing of human and non-human life on Earth have value in themselves. These are independent of the usefulness of the non-human world for human purposes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really a, a statement of, of values and spiritual apprehension, right? At the, that's, yeah. then that's the very first thing there. Yeah, right? That's right. Yeah. I, I guess what's been interesting is to see um, the developments among religions, you know, trying to deal with this, you know, people, various religions trying to redefine themselves and, you know, because religion is important culturally in how people, you know, deal with the world, you know, and it often, of course, it's, there's a lot of atrocities with it, but it often provides an ethical basis for people. And so, you know, there's been quite a lot of effort um, on that direction, like one of the things we did a few years ago, there's a, there's a book by Bron Taylor called the Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia of Religion and Nature. It's a two-volume thing, and it's sort of, it's basically concerned with this issue. You know, we had quite a big discussion on left bio about the spiritual basis of left biocentrism. I think it was a thousand-word article they accepted ultimately. You know, but so that was quite a good discussion. At the same time. You know, you have people like Stan Rowe, that they have an Earth Manifesto. And one of the things was, I mean, they're very close to me, but they basically, they're science-based, you know, and they mm -hmm. feel that on science, on a science basis, you can show how uh, nature is primary, you know, and humans are secondary. So there's some little bit of kind of disagreement there, but... And they don't feel the need then, therefore, for a spiritual component yeah, to the whole thing because they don't need it in a sense no, intellectually. I, they came up as scientists, you know, yeah. sort of thing. But um, you know, Stan Rowe, well, he worked in forestry, and um, it's, I can't remember the name of the other guy, but he's a friend of mine, believe it or not. And uh, but they, you know, they both have science qualifications. So yeah. when we had that discussion, they sort of distanced themselves from it. But I'd say most other people you know, believe that there's a spiritual com component, the same as I do. You know. yeah. well, in, in, in the Green Party, you don't have that kind of discussion, really, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you might have Elizabeth May hanging a cross around her neck, you know, but mm -hmm. then going to go into theology school after she doesn't win in the next election, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, that's, that's the limit of it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the, on the left, you know, I kind of understand it a bit on the left because the, there was such a great effort in the early days of, of uh, you know, Marx and Engels to, to be scientific and therefore not to be spiritual. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's kind of rubbed its way off you yeah. know, down the ages as, as though the two were absolutely at odds with one another, which they aren't necessarily. I always right. remember that phrase, rural idiocy. You know. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. They were going to escape. They were going to help us escape from rural idiocy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I, yeah. I still like, uh, I still like that the eleventh thesis on Feuerbach. You know, the philosophers only interpret in the world. The point, however, is to change it. You know. Yes, 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 yes. yes absolutely. One final one, and uh, there's a phrase that you that obviously means a lot to you and means a lot to other people, and it's Aldo Leopold's comment that one has to try and think like a mountain. Yeah. How do you do that? Uh, well, one, you know, one could start with how he came to that, you know, and um, basically, you probably know all this, and I, I guess I'm doing it for the tape, but he, he was out when he was a younger forester, and they're out at the top of a I guess a, a hill or something like that, and looking down and they saw 
a she-wolf and some pups. And so, like any red-blooded American, then he got his gun out and uh, they started shooting. And they went down and they found the she-wolf uh, dying. And he said, uh, he said he looked into her eyes and saw the green fire, you know. And like that, in some ways, was a transformation from him from a resource forester to someone, you know, who moved in a much more deep ecology sense, you know. And uh, I don't know if um, that explains it to me. Well, it, uh, it, it certainly explains for, for me how it transforms Leopold. It reminds me of the, of the last time I caught a fish and mm. watched the fish die and thought, I will never mm. do this again. You yeah. know? Um, but I'm not sure that it got me to the phrase, thinking like a mountain. You know? Okay, no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I wrote a column many years, you know, after all the stuff with dimension and uh, the rotten line they took on the computers at Sir George. Once I started becoming involved in ecology, I used to write for Dimension. I had a column for them for two years, you know. And anyway, one of the columns was on thinking like a ma mountain, you know, sort of thing like that. I guess it's like part of that council of all beings, you know, like um, like when Leopold was s saying, you know, like I guess the other, of course I often miss out a lot, but what he's saying there too is that you need predators if you want to have a healthy deer. You know, like, and if you don't do that, the mountain is going to suffer because the mountain will be overgrazed. And so, mm -hmm. you know, he came to realize that, you know. And so thinking like a mountain, it always sounds sort of absurd to somebody. Who, but it, it's like looking at things from a different way. It's, I remember once writing on that bio, and Andy McLaughlin commented on that. They had a pile of logs here and I used to be so upset by <laughs> every time I go by it and think about I know this is terrible to say but think about a concentration camp and the victims being skeletons being piled up there you know like I mean I know that sounds like blasphemy for some people but you sort of think like that you know and so it's basically again moving away from from human centeredness to this ecocentric view of the world, you know. And mm -hmm. like that thinking like a mountain is really a good example of that. Although the funny thing is that, um, and I only found out when I wrote the, that recent blog, that Leopold, even up into the 40s, he's some, you know, he was part of this wolf management in Wisconsin and he supported a car on wolves, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, which really blew me away because I sort of, I'd, I'd run with the other thing quite a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. But even after that experience of seeing the green fire go out in the yeah, she-wolf's lives, he still was... Yeah. Well, it's like a political, you know, like you have, um, well, you, you could see it here on anything, right? You have a intense right-wing or redneck lobby, you know, wanting wolves killed or something, and you know, you start to think when you're in the system, well, what you can get away with and what you can't and what concessions you have to make. But to me, I would never have made that concession because it undermined, basically, that contribution he made. Because mm. Leopold has uh, been enormously influential, particularly in the United States. Like I, I've written in, for, for Earth First Journal a few articles and been to some of their meetings and uh, all his phrases, you know, have, they're part of that culture, you mm. know, the mm -hmm. Earth First culture. And, um, you know, so that when somebody like that, who's symbolically so important, makes a concession, I, I think it's really bad. Of course, he didn't know he was going to be that important No, no, either, that's right, you know, that's, but, right. Uh, that's right. But you're right, it, you, yeah. know, you look back on that and you say, yes, this yeah. was, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, this has been really, yeah. Delightful and very revealing. Over all over the map. Yeah. Well, I think we were, but I think that's fine. <laughs> you know, thank you so much. No, okay, and thank you both for for coming. Okay. David Orton, apostle of deep ecology. For the Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Thanks for watching.